So, uh, welcome to this uh, UL VLC session. Hold, bear with me while I bring up my script. My name is Sam Harlow. I am the online learning librarian for UNCG Libraries. Jenny Dale, who's going to be presenting today and asked me to introduce this, is proposed the University Libraries Virtual Learning Community, the ULVLC as a way to promote peer learning and build community within the UNCG University Libraries during the COVID-19 pandemic. Many of us are working remotely and I hope this project helps everyone in the libraries to learn and share even while we are working at a social distance. If you'd like to find the archived recording of the session later on or see what else we have scheduled, uh, please visit the LibGuide that I'm about to drop into the chat. You can also learn more about the project and indicate your interest all through this guide. Here. So um, I'm going to cover some logistical things about how this uh, session is going to run. You are muted upon entry, uh, so please keep yourself muted during the presentation by clicking the audio icon next to your name to turn it red. But feel free to turn your audio on by clicking the audio icon either at the bottom left of your screen or next to your name at the end of this session to participate in a conversation with the presenter. If you do not have a microphone, you are also welcome to participate in chat. If you have any questions throughout this session, please put them in the chat. Uh, I, Sam Harlow, will track the questions in the chat while they, um, while uh, Jenny is presenting. So I'm about to put my email in the chat in case y'all don't have it. And uh, if there are any technical sessions, you're welcome to email me. But also remember that this session is being recorded. So worst case scenario, if your internet goes out or if you're experiencing the issues uh, that I can't really help you with on my end, we will get you this, this recording for sure. So if there are any questions, please put them in the chat. And I will get to them as um, I'm presenting this session's host. So this session is being hosted by UNCG Libraries Information Literacy Coordinator, Jenny Dale. She will be presenting on algorithms of oppression. So I don't see any questions in the chat. So Jenny, I'm gonna meet myself. All right, awesome. Um, can everyone hear me okay? If you could just chat a couple of you if you're hearing me all right, that would be awesome. Okay, wonderful. So many of you. What a great community. All right, so I'm presenting today on algorithms of oppression. Um, and I have a note on here. You may not really be able to see it because my screen is doing some weird stuff. But uh, let me tell you right now that I will share with you at the end of this the links, uh, the link to this presentation. Um, it is going to be open to anyone with UNCG login um, so that you will be able to click on links that I have in here to articles, to videos, that kind of stuff. Um, but I've borrowed this title from uh, Dr. Safiya Umoja Noble, who is currently uh, an associate professor in information studies and in African American studies at UCLA. And she published a book in 2018 called Algorithms of Oppression, um, which is it was kind of what part of what got me really interested in this topic. Um, so I have borrowed her title because I just can't think of a better one. Couple things during this. Um, I will be showing videos if I can. I won't be showing them with audio because I find that really glitchy. So when I am showing videos, I will have closed captioning on. But again, I want to assure you that I will make the link available so that you can go to the slide to later and play the videos if you want to listen with sound. Uh, for the most part, I won't show the whole thing. Um, so you'll be able to just kind of see little bits and pieces of it today, but could always go back and watch it later on. Um, and there will be a couple of times that I ask you to type things into the chat. Again, like Sam said, if you have questions as I'm going through, please put those in the chat. Um, when I ask you to chat responses, Sam, you don't have to read all of those out loud. When I'm asking for chat responses, I will head over to the chat so that I can kind of summarize what's happening. Um, and yeah, I'm going to go ahead and get started. So if you don't know me, I'm Jenny Dale. I use she, her, hers pronouns, and I am the information literacy coordinator, and I'm also the liaison to four academic units, communication studies, English, media studies, and women's gender and sexuality studies. This is a 
modification of a presentation that I did a couple of weeks ago, back when, you know, classes were still happening on campus, those, those olden days, um, that I did for a 400 level communication studies class uh, that is a, that's about um, civic engagement in the digital age or in the digital world. So I used, uh, again, a modified version of this with that group. Um, and so I thought, hey, I have this presentation almost ready to go. And I proposed this UL VLC, so why not uh, put my money where my mouth is? I am not a computer scientist. I am not a mathematician. I'm not a programmer or coder, and I'm not a sociologist, although uh, concepts from all of these areas will come up in this talk. Uh, I just want it to be clear that I am not uh, purporting or pretending to be any of these uh, kinds of experts. I'm a librarian, so my expertise is in information. So this is our first chat prompt. Um, this word algorithm gets used all the time. I, if you do a Google News search for algorithm, you'll probably see some stuff coming up. Um, so I would love for y'all to throw in the chat um, what this word means to you. I know we have people from all different areas of the library, people with all different backgrounds. Um, so I would love to see what you think of when you hear this word algorithm. And I'm pulling the chat up so that I can see what you're typing. So Rachel and Sarah both have sort of uh, variations on formula. Rachel's formula for how things are presented to us based on previous behaviors, that's part of it. Some type of formula that pulls specific information to the forefront, mathematical function or process, formula for sifting information, way of formulating a subject. So this word formula is coming up a lot. See, I'm glad I told you I wasn't a mathematician. So just so I'll talk a little bit while people might still be typing. Um, so, so some people have kind of given a more general infer, like a more general definition, like Caroline's mathematical function or process. Sarah said formula. Um, so these are definitely ideas that relate to algorithms, especially in that broader sense. Several people have mentioned more of the like information function of algorithms. Um, so even just, I'm not seeing any new chats come in, so I'm going to head back over, but again, feel free to chat anytime. Um, but I'm going to head on back to mine, and I'm going to give you the Oxford English Dictionary definition, because like I said, I'm the English librarian, so this is my Bible. Um, from the OED, in mathematics and computing, an algorithm is a procedure or set of rules used in calculation and problem solving, and later use specifically a precisely defined set of mathematical or logical operations for the performance of a particular task. So algorithm defined generally is this, it's this idea that it's some sort of set of rules or set of functions um, or operations that perform a task. Now, when we talk about them, just like many of you said, it's usually in, uh, in like the context of thinking about information or information sources, and that's definitely my focus today. So this is the argument I'm making, um, and this is what I'm going to be trying to sort of prove to you throughout this presentation. Uh, in a technology-driven culture, algorithms impact the way we see and experience the world and the way the world sees us, but we can't see them. So algorithms, uh, for the most part, when we talk about technology, these algorithms are proprietary. They're black box technologies in the sense that we can see our inputs and we can see outputs, but we can't tell what's happening in between. There's some sort of magic happening in there. Um, and it's usually, again, proprietary, so we aren't really able to see how the algorithm is working, except based on our experience of inputs and outputs. Um, I'm going to take kind of a three-pronged approach here. Uh, there's so much research out there um, across different subject areas about how algorithms and how um, automated decision making using algorithms can impact us or does impact us in our daily lives in small and in pretty major ways. Um, so I'm going to just do kind of an overview today and I'm going to talk about three main concepts. The first is going to be search engines uh, and potential search engine bias. 
I'm going to talk about filter bubbles, and then I'm going to talk about the use of automated decision making tools to make really major decisions sometimes about us uh, in terms of our social and financial well being. All right, so my first section here, I asked this question, are search engines neutral? And you can probably um, predict that I'm gonna say no, they're not. So I have another chat prompt. I'm seeing chats coming in here. Um, Uh-oh, did something bad happen? I'm seeing people say no. That was uh -oh. to you asking about I was like, oh no, what, what did I do wrong? No, that, Thank yeah, you. that was just the search engine thing. Y'all are just incredible students. I was just, I, I just assumed I had done something wrong. Okay, so here's my next question for you. I would love to hear some concerns you personally have had about Google or have heard other people have about Google. Yep, so I'm seeing a lot of different things. Ooh, yes, so much, so much. So a couple people have talked about ads, uh, prioritizes results based on payment or advertising. Wow, it's almost like y'all have seen parts of my presentation before. Um, I'm gonna be talking about a lot of this stuff. Yeah, Rachel, I'm gonna talk about Google image search and sort of how that, um, what, what kind of impact that can have. Uh, people have talked a lot about the sort of capitalist uh, concerns, loads of racial and gender bias in Google search results. Um, lots of issues related to privacy. I'm seeing ads again, that idea of sort of that the fact that Google is, it's a company, it's a, it's a product, it's not a public good um, in the way that we might have uh, thought about it. Um, so one of the things I like to think about with Google um, is uh, if you remember when Google first kind of came out and got big, um, there was this idea that I thought was pretty pervasive about it being like the, the new public library for the world um, because it provided us with access that we could freely get to as long as we had internet. Um, to lots of information. And like Juanita mentioned, um, they have changed a lot of their algorithms, their indexing model, a lot of things about how your search results work over time. Um, so, and that's something that we, we don't always talk about or think about. These are things that we kind of do automatically. I imagine if I asked all of you if you've searched Google um, today, you'd probably all say yes, um, unless we've got like a diehard Bing fan in here. But Unfortunately, Bing does the exact same stuff. Okay, so this is the search engine landscape. I was kind of hoping Steve would be here because I was really proud that I used IBISWorld, a business database, all by myself. Uh, this shows the, uh, basically the, the competitive landscape um, in the you search engines in the US. So this is from an industry report from IBIS World. Um, and you can see that 58.6%, which translates to $52.6 billion, that red part is Alphabet Inc, which is, which is Google. That's the company that technically owns Google, but Google is uh, most of that company. Uh, we have that little uh, orange part, which is Microsoft Bing, 4.5%, 4.0 billion which is still a pretty solid amount of money there. And then we have these other maybe smaller search engines to make up for 36.9% of the industry revenue. So in her book, uh, well, actually, let me go ahead and do this. Um, the, the thing about having such a monopoly, which I think, again, if we look back at this, uh, that's, that's a monopoly. Um, if we have one company that's over half and the other main company that's being used makes up 4.5% and then the other 37% is all tiny uh, companies kind of coming together. Um, what we see is that if there is kind of a standout search engine, that's the one that has the money to be able to uh, make itself better. So this industry definitely has a lot of, it's gonna always tend towards higher levels of concentration. 
um, unless we change the model or change the way that we think about search engines. So a large user base, this is from that same industry report, um, you know, brings in more money and that money allows them, uh, the money and the data they have allows them to just get better and better in terms of user experience. And then their user base is going to increase, which creates a cycle that's going to just reinforce this dominance. So until we have uh, search engines that people like as much as Google or search engines that compete with Google, it's going to stay in this uh, really privileged position of being the main competitor in that area. So Sophia Noble uh, in her book, which I highly recommend in which we do have unlimited user access to as an ebook. So if people are interested in reading some of it as like a ULVLC reading group, let me know. I'd be excited to talk to you about that. So she talks about how we, we often think of search engines a certain way, but it's important to always keep in mind that they are social, economic, and human projects. Um, she's not the only scholar that's talked about this, but I think she does a particularly good job talking about it. But the issue is that, they're, that the way search engines work has really been naturalized to us as kind of objective. And people are questioning this more and more, but for a long time, um, I would say this was definitely seen as a, a neutral process because it was run by math. It was run by algorithms. It was run by science. So it was very procedural um, and people weren't always talking about what uh, sort of social constructs and what social issues were uh, in, in that ecosystem that this exists, right? So people weren't always thinking about that or talking about it as much as they have been for the past about 10 years now, but really in the last few years, we've seen a huge increase in interest, uh, scholarly interest in this. So one of the things that got me interested in this was a viral uh, video from Twitter in 2016. Um, so I'd been thinking a little bit about Google at this point, but this really hit home for me when I was thinking about their image search. Um, so there was a Twitter user who showed a video of the difference of searching three black teenagers and three white teenagers in Google images. And that video got a ton of media attention. So um, over on the right, I just have a screenshot from my phone of the kind of media outlets that were covering it. So major papers, Guardian, uh, USA Today, Washington Post, big uh, Time Magazine, major news outlet there. Um, and this, again, it attracted a lot of attention. And now if you do the search, it's interesting because when you do this, uh, um, and I'll show you, uh, three black teenagers. If I go to images, uh, most of the images are actually from articles talking about this phenomenon. So it doesn't work the same way it used to. And that's one of the things that can be interesting when we start to criticize or question Google because uh, the search results are naturally going to change and then sometimes sort of unnaturally they change their algorithm or they change their indexing or the ways that things come up. Um, but right now it doesn't work the way that it used to. If we go down a little further, we are still seeing a lot of the same kind of results where basically this Twitter user was showing that black teenagers were criminalized in Google images and white teenagers were like very weirdly um, like like they're very sporty. Um, they all like there's this image that was always coming up um, for three white teenagers. Let's see. You can't see it. Uh, you can see it sort of here where like one person's holding a soccer ball, one person's holding a football and one person is holding a basketball like they're playing all the sports all at the same time. That's what white teenagers do. All right, Google responded to this. Um, there's an interesting BBC article about it, which again, when you have these slides, you'll be able to click on that link. Um, and essentially what they're saying is their search results are a reflection of how people um, how people tag images, how people describe images, the metadata of those images, um, and they're just sort of like it talks about including the frequency of which, which which types of image appear and the way they're described online. So this means that sometimes unpleasant portrayals of sensitive subject matter online can affect that what image search results appear for a given query. These results don't reflect Google's own opinions or beliefs as a company. We strongly value a diversity of perspectives, ideas, and cultures. So they're basically saying that this is the internet's fault and this is the people's fault. So um, this was a, an interesting response from a Google spokesperson. 
So meanwhile, um, at this time, Sophia Noble, who I've mentioned several times, um, started doing some re like research on racist and sexist algorithmic bias. Um, so I am gonna, let me look at my time here. I'm going to show you a couple of minutes of this and again I'll have the closed captioning on um, so that you can read it but once again assuring you uh, I'll try to have there it is the, these are auto generated so they're not perfect so I'm hoping that people are able to see the captions, but again, um, I will make this available later. And Sam kindly dropped the link to this. <sighs> Wish my link down bar would go away, but I can't always have what you want. Now, I don't think this is necessarily true if with our audience. We might not feel this way, but I do think that's a general perception that Google search results are representative of a variety of perspectives. So I'm going to pause it there. And again, I definitely encourage watching this video. Uh, she's a great speaker and she um, has a lot of interesting things to say. She's also done uh, a lot of longer talks about this topic. Um, but one of the things that, you know, she focuses a lot on uh, intersectionality, particularly as it, as it presents in race and gender. So you saw her talking about the search for black girls uh, or Latina girls or Asian girls and the way those sort of presentations came up online and what implications that has for people who are already uh, marginalized or who are already suffering from systemic oppression. Okay, so let's see what I have here. One. So I'm going to ask y'all to take a moment to Google, uh, do Google image search. So you can always just Google it and click on the images tab like you saw me do. Um, and uh, three of these are things that I um, have used as search examples in classes that also are in Dr. Noble's book. And then the last one is another one that I just came up with because I had a, a hunch about how these things would be presented. So if you'll search for one or two of these and then just kind of type something into the chat about what messages we're getting when we see image results like this from Google.
yes, professor <laughs> is all old white dudes. Um, and this is interesting. She talks about this in her book because um, ostensibly, you know, Google knows a whole lot about us and therefore that Google should know that she is a professor who is not a white man. Um, she identifies as a woman and she is a person of color. So she was surprised at the kind of results that she was getting. Um, because again, usually Google does some customization, some personaliza personalization based on your search history or what it knows about you. Um, yeah, unprofessional hair, that's what I use a lot in class um, because the the imagery is, I mean, if you're, you know, if you try, try to imagine a situation, right, where you are going for a job interview and you search for unprofessional hair. Lois, I'm gonna have to check that out in a second. Um, so under unprofessional hairstyles or unprofessional hair, um, it is mostly uh, black women with natural hair or women of color with natural hair. Um, and you know, that's, these are sort of insidious messages that we get. Um, yeah, the search for beautiful is weird. I'm intrigued um, by Joe getting M&M in the search result for beautiful. Um, yeah, Melody points out, and uh, Maggie said something like this as well, it's still pretty white or light-skinned people. The other thing I noticed when I searched for beautiful, um, especially when thinking about it in the context of these other things, is, is their hair. Still, most of them um, have straight or um, like uh, relaxed hair, even if they are uh, not white. Um, I contend with this issue a lot for our Women of Color blog as looking for royalty-free images for certain professionals is always white people. Yes, stock photography. Um, there's an interesting video that came out. Um, uh, the YouTuber is Antoine Speaks about the three black teenagers, three white teenagers search. Um, and one of the things he talks about is that most of the images for white teenagers were stock photos, right? And we um, are just not seeing the same kind of stock photography. like. Uh, people of color are not showing up in stock photography as much. And that's another huge sort of social message that we're getting from what our sort of results are and what we're able to see. Yes, I too received the Christina Aguilera beautiful uh, screenshot from this. Um, oh, thanks, Joe. That's helpful. But yeah, I, again, I would I was glad to see some like some perceived racial and ethnic diversity on this. Um, again, they're almost all people that we would probably identify visually as women. Um, and then we are also looking here again at people who tend to have uh, people who are thin, um, people who sort of have these uh, the prescribed notions. <laughs> I'm intrigued by this cats um, one because cats, in my opinion, cats is not a beautiful musical. So Brown says just professional by itself. I have some, I have some thoughts. Yeah, cool. White people in suits. All right. So again, we are looking at this with a critical eye already and that's helping us um, kind of sift through these and understand these messages. But, you know, one of the things that Sophia Noble talks about in her book is that she's got nieces and she's got a stepdaughter who are, uh, at the time she started this project, were black girls. And when she started searching for black girls, the messages that, again, were mostly related to pornography, um, those, are, those weren't the kind of messages that she would have wanted um, her stepdaughter or her nieces to, to have from the internet and the internet is full of messages and we're getting them all the time. So she talks about how, you know, sometimes this, that like the algorithm as a sort of monolithic concept gets blamed. Um, but she talks about how it's not, you know, algorithms are, are made by people. We can't separate this from the people who create them and uh, the societies sort of in which they are uh, created, the social constructs, the systems of oppression that already exist. 
And she talks a lot about this issue of capital. Um, and she says, search results reflect the values and norms of the search company's commercial partners and advertisers, and often reflect our lowest and most demeaning beliefs. So again, this idea of objective and popular being how search results work makes it seem as if misogynist or racist search results are a simple mirror of the collective. And that's problematic in a lot of ways. Um, it can be argued that Google functions in the interest of its most influential paid advertisers or through an intersection of popular and commercial interests. Yet Google's users think of it as a public resource generally free from commercial interest. Now again, we are not typical Google users here. Um, we are people who think a lot about information, who work in an information world. Um, and so it's hard sometimes for me to, to imagine this, um, but when I think about myself being younger before, you know, like just being in college, before I was a librarian, before I worked in the library, um, I definitely didn't think about how search engines worked or what made them work. So getting back to uh, that IBIS world, that industry uh, report that I talked about earlier, when you look at the capital that's going into search industry or search engine industry, the products and services, it's all about who's paying for ads. Um, so banner ads, video ads, paid search. So search engine optimization, um, which is often kind of, uh, it's not, it's, it can be invisible, right? We can't always know if a company paid more money to have their results bumped up to the top because those are not always going to come up with that little ad notification next to it like a sort of traditional paid advertisement would. So we, we can't separate a, a search engine, even something that we use so frequently like Google, we can't separate it um, from that capital that's coming in. Uh, and that's, something to, to always kind of keep in mind as you're thinking about it. Um, whether you're seeing an ad notification or not, there's, there's money somehow involved in what your search results look like. So the next section I wanna talk about um, this idea of the internet being curated for us. And um, this is something that people are talking about a lot, especially in terms of sort of personalization or recommendation engines. I'm going to talk about autocomplete functions, which um, have changed quite a bit in Google. I'm going to talk about filter bubbles, and I want to talk a little bit about this idea of echo chambers. Um, so this is uh, from a campaign. I wish that this would like truly go into full screen. Um, let me refresh my, I've been signed out. How did I get signed out? Okay. I guess some stuff's been happening behind the scenes for me here. Um, so I'm gonna go to this. Uh, it's another sort of case study that I have, um, which is from a series of ads uh, for UN Women by Ogilvy and Dubai. They were the photographers and sort of advertising um, execs or uh, advertisers who did this. And I know you won't be able to see it particularly well. Again, when you have this, you'll be able to get the link to an article about it as from the UN and also a little video that was their video ad that they ran on television and online. But basically it has, the, these were autocompletes about women. And so they used phrases in this ad campaign like, women need to, and that's the one over on the left, and it says women need to be put in their place, to know their place, to be controlled. The uh, second one from the left there, women shouldn't, and it's women shouldn't have rights, women shouldn't uh, vote, women shouldn't work, uh, that kind of thing. So again, these sort of messages and this messaging that we're getting all the time when we just do a basic Google search that kind of might get in our head when we're not thinking about it, might not be something we're conscious of. And Google has changed their uh, search uh, autocomplete quite a bit. So now if you type in women should, there's just no autocomplete. It doesn't give you any suggestions. Um, and this is kind of counter to what Google always says about how they deal with their algorithms. Um, they usually say like, oh, we, we don't change it. We can't change it. You know, this is just, it's going to run the way it's going to run. Um, but then things like this come out and all of a sudden it magically changes. Um, and the next case I'm going to talk about, uh, there's another video here that I'm going to show you. Um, actually, I guess it's not this one, but I will show you this video about, so can y'all tell me in the chat if you have 
heard of filter bubbles. Good. So filter bubbles, um, Eli Pariser, who's in this video, um, is basically the person who coined this term. Um, so I'm going to play a couple minutes of this uh, video here. Again, it'll be the same kind of deal where it's closed caption, no, no sound, but you will have the, you have the link, Sam put it in the chat, um, but it'll also be linked in the um, slides that I send out. So. So this particular one, uh, this particular video, he talks about the role that uh, filter bubbles can have in democracy and elections. And he talks about confirmation bias quite a bit. Okay, so I'm pausing it there um, and I want to just talk for a moment here about um, his, what, no, uh, some of the points that he makes there. So one of the things he talks about is that this, this concept of filter bubbles came up in an internet context, but it's not like the, what's behind it, especially as it deals with confirmation bias, is not an internet exclusive issue, right? So we've always uh, sought out different kinds of media that confirm our values or that make us feel good um, about the choices that we've made. So for instance, I always use this example with students. I'm a vegetarian, so if I see a, a headline that says, you know, studies shows vegetarians, um, you know, live longer, I'm like, yeah, this is great. I'm a great person. I'm, uh, you know, morally upright by making this choice um, and I'm going to live forever, basically, is what I, what I see when I see something like that and I decide to share it. Uh, the internet just makes that a lot easier to do and it makes our sort of this idea of the filter bubble is, especially in terms of social media, although this happens a lot with um, Google generally or with Google news searches, things like that, is the algorithm takes into account your preferences, which, you know, I feel like if we thought about that objectively, we'd be like, oh, that's kind of nice sometimes, you know, maybe I don't need to see, um, you know, ads for this, if, well, maybe I don't need to see beef ads if the internet knows I'm a vegetarian, for example. But what happens is that it restricts your point of view. So if I only click on articles from the New York Times and the Guardian, and other and the Washington Post and other publications that um, have been sort of identified as having sort of a liberal perspective, which we could argue about for a whole nother hour, but we won't. But it's going to always show me that kind of stuff. So it's always like my social media, my Facebook, uh, my Twitter, whatever. Um, I'm too old for all the other ones, but they really will show me the kind of it's going to show me what it thinks I want to see. And what that ends up doing and what it's done, we, we can see it pretty clearly in this country, is that it's polarized people, especially when we think about politics. So I think about my, you know, for example, my dad has the pretty much exact opposite political beliefs that I do. Um, and so his experience on Facebook is really different than my experience on Facebook. So when when he and I talk, sometimes I feel like we're speaking different languages because the information that we're getting um, is all from a certain perspective. So we'll talk a little bit 
um, at the end about how we can like burst these filter bubbles, which sounds really gross, but um, how we can kind of get out of these echo chambers and kind of deal with um, seeking out different perspectives. But the thing is like, you have to want to do that. You have to be aware of it and you have to like actively go out and spend time seeking out other perspectives because they're not going to be right there for you the way that perspectives that are similar to your own will be. And if uh, we want to talk about a particular disturbing case of this happening, um, Dylan Roof, who uh, was the, the church shooter in um, South Carolina, uh, 2016 or 2017. This is a, a quote from an article um, from Teaching Tolerance. Um, I do have my references cited at the end here so you can get to it. Um, and it does have a link to this article. But this idea that, um, Google's algorithm is what they say, they call it deaf to dog whistles. So if you're not familiar with this term dog whistles in terms of sort of political, political communication, um, coded language. Um, so we're going to watch again a little bit of the video here. Um, same kind of deal, but what you'll see is that Dylan Roof was searching Google for uh, using terminology like black on white crime. Um, and that's what we would consider a uh, dog whistle, um, uh, dog whistle, I'm trying to think of the right word, dog whistle tech, not tech, text, um, dog whistle politics. Uh, so it's not saying that it's racist, but it's sort of a racist way that we would talk about it. So I am going to show this one, same deal here. Oh, nope, I don't know why I got it there. But we will talk about this. And again, you'll have a link to this. Um, and this is a very interesting video. We'll talk a little bit more um, after I give you a couple of minutes to watch it. And this is from the Southern Poverty Law Center, as you see, which has a particular perspective um, on hate crimes and hate groups. All right, so I'm going to stop that one there. Again, I definitely recommend watching this one, although this it's tough. This is a tough watch um, because of the, you know, the content and because we know what happens here with him. Um, but this is a, a way that we can think about filter bubbles in a really disturbing way that had a, a, a fatal impact on people's lives. Um, and this this isn't to say that Google made Dylan Roof kill those people. Google didn't. Um, but when we have uh, 
when we have that kind of paired with other issues, so maybe there were mental health issues, maybe he just had, maybe he was just ripe for radicalization for some reason that we don't necessarily know. I mean, we know it's a, we live in a white supremacist society, so that would be the ultimate reason, but we, you know, we can't blame Google for it, but we can certainly say that there was a contribution here. Um, and that again, that filter bubble, it saw that he liked these kinds of sites um, and it just kept giving him that same information. Um, and this was, as she says in the video, there were spikes in these kind of searches around the time of the Trayvon Martin case, um, the Trayvon Martin murder. And we, you know, we have to, to start thinking about when we look back on it, you know, what, what kind of filter bubbles were at play and how dangerous they were and how dangerous they became. Okay, so finally, my final section here, I want to talk about automated decision making. So algorithms for health, social and financial services. Um, and one of the things that I highly recommend reading, um, if this is something you're interested in, is Automating Inequality by Virginia Eubanks. Came out in 2018, the same year as Algorithms of Oppression. Um, and what she says kind of early in that book is, digital tracking and decision making systems have become routine in policing political forecasting, marketing, credit reporting, criminal sentencing, business management, finance, and the administration of public programs. So she's kind of um, bringing out here the, again, sort of widespread use of these digital uh, decision-making systems. Um, and she goes on to argue that these uh, kinds of systems, this automated decision-making, so decision-making that's not being done by people, uh, shatters the social safety net, criminalizes the poor, intensifies discrimination, and compromises our deepest national values. And she kind of proves this or tries to prove it by looking at different case studies. And one of her case studies was one I wasn't familiar with, but it, it resulted in an actual um, court case, Indiana versus IBM. So in 2006, the state of Indiana um, under at that time a governor who was running or kind of uh, gaining popularity popularity on a platform of like fixing the welfare system and like uh, kind of he was presenting a lot of data about uh, welfare recipients using their sort of public benefits to you know buy alcohol or you know the, the same kind of things that we've seen really since Ronald Reagan started talking about welfare queens, but he was kind of riding on this wave of people thinking like, oh gosh, people are really taking advantage of our welfare system. So he was able to get enough traction with that to uh, sign a more than a, it was, I think ended up being like 1.3 or 1.6 billion dollar contract with IBM to automate public benefits. And so by public benefits here, uh, primarily talking about Medicaid, as you see down below, SNAP or food, so Supplemental Nutritional Assistance Program, and TANF, uh, Temporary Assistance for Needy Families. And so they created this automated system, IBM. Um, it had a higher error rate than previous procedures, and people are, like the, the procedures that were human beings making these decisions or looking at applications. Um, and this negative, negatively impacted people who were poor, people living under, um, under the poverty line or people who were struggling financially. Um, and the, she, she does a lot of storytelling in this book. She interviewed a lot of people. She takes a kind of journalistic approach to her work. And she talks about specific, particularly terrible stories where, um, you know, sick children who really, really needed that Medicaid couldn't get it um, because of system errors. And then the people who actually worked in these offices, uh, power and agency was taken away from them to a certain extent. So they couldn't help people as much because, again, there was this algorithm that was supposed to be solving problems instead of causing problems. Um, Indiana canceled that contract in 2009, so it ran for about two years. They got a new governor and the contract was canceled. Um, and then Indiana actually um, sued IBM um, for, uh, to try to get some damages costs. And it actually was still being litigated up to 2019 um, when the Indiana Supreme Court did um, order IBM to pay some damages. Uh, back to the state of Indiana. 
uh, in IBM had also sued Indiana. It was kind of a mess. Um, so this is um, a recent uh, case back in the fall, um, getting into the winter. Uh, so the Apple card controversy. So um, you may have heard of this. This kind of got a lot of press again. Um, in November 2019, uh, a software developer, uh, David Heinemeyer Hansen, uh, he and his wife both applied for the Goldman Sachs Apple card. And uh, they, they have, because they're married, they file jointly. Um, her credit is actually better than his. Her credit score is higher, things like that. But he got a, a credit limit that was 20 times uh, higher than what his wife got when they applied for this card. And this was, again, another sort of viral conversation. Uh, and in an interview with Slate Magazine, um, Kathy O'Neill, who wrote a great book called Weapons of Math Destruction, which is about algorithms and machine learning and automated decision making, um, in that they kind of asked her uh, point blank, even though she wasn't actually involved in this uh, particular inc incident, they asked her, hey, uh, do you think this was gender bias? And what she said, which I think is really interesting and true is, you know, it could be, but we don't know. And the reason we don't know is because we don't know how these decisions are made. We don't, we don't have the insight into these algorithms that do ultimately make these kind of decisions. Um, and she refers to it in the article as a, an invisible system of harm because it's, as she says here, unaccountable and opaque and Apple doesn't really care. Around the same time, there was a study that came out that again got a lot of press, uh, Obermeyer et al, about uh, a very commonly used predictive healthcare algorithm, um, which they found, surprise, surprise, huge disparities in bias, particularly around race. So they compared black patients and white patients, um, and what they found was when those two patients, like if we compared a black patient and a white patient who had the same risk score, which is part of what's taken into account here, um, black patients were actually significantly sicker. So if we said, all right, these two people have a, a level five risk score out of 10 or something, I don't actually know how the algorithm works, but if we say they have the same risk score, we would assume they're at about the same level of health, but that's not true. Um, and one of the things that's important to note is that the uh, algorithm takes into account healthcare costs, like how much money was spent on this person's healthcare in years past. In a response to this article in Science, so it came out in Science, uh, the journal Science, and Ruha Benjamin, who has a relatively recent book called Race After Technology, um, in which she talks about what she calls the new gym code, as in ways that technology is policing us in the same way that uh, Jim Crow laws did. Uh, she writes that it's important that we're not just like letting algorithms take the blame. So it's important that the bias of algorithms does not overshadow the discriminatory context that makes automated tools so important in the first place. If individuals and institutions valued black people more, they would not cost less and thus this tool might work similarly, similarly for all. So in all of this, there's always this warning to not just blame the algorithm because that's what I see happening a lot in, in media coverage of these kinds of issues. Like, oh, the algorithm is wrong. The algorithm is not neutral. Uh, the algorithm has problems. Again, the algorithms are made by people um, based on the, the context in which we live and the society in which we live. And then final example here um, is uh, COMPASS, which is, uh, stands for Correctional Offender Management Profiling for Alternative Sanctions. So I bet it's a backronym. I bet they were like, what if we call it COMPASS? And then they figured out what it might mean. Um, so it's just, there are lots of criminal justice uh, predictive algorithm tools, um, but this particular one is used a lot. It has high usage um, across the United States. And there was a study in uh, ProPublica in 2016 that concluded that it was unreliable and racially biased. That study came under, like, got some heat um, from the company that runs Compass, of course, but also from other people who said that maybe the uh, it wasn't totally sound the way that it was done. 
Um, so a couple of other researchers in 2018 did a similar study and what they ultimately found, they recruited, I think 400 people just from the internet, um, from a crowdsourcing website and they gave them uh, two factors or two features about each person and they predicted recidivism at the same uh, accuracy level as Compass, which uses 137 features or factors. Um, so basically, this is one of those times when we can ask a question of why we're using algorithms if they're not any better than people. Um, if they're not better at predicting or they're not better at, you know, making decisions than like people are. Um, so finally, talking about how we can reduce these impacts, uh, Sophia Noble talks about something that I think is, it's, it's aspirational, maybe someday it would be great to have a public non-commercial search. So this idea of just completely taking advertising and capital and money out of the whole uh, equation. Um, and that's sort of one of the big ideas that she puts out there towards the end of her book. And then if we think about what that means, it means greater transparency. It means for us to sort of understand what's going on. And she says here to slow down the automation of our worst impulses. So we have automated human decision making and then disavowed our responsibility for it. So thinking about how we can get public funding in something like a public non-commercial search. For filter bubbles, the easiest thing you can do is try to seek out other media sources. That's not fun most of the time. Um, every once in a while, I do try to look at things that don't align with my political beliefs. Again, it's kind of painful because I don't want to see that kind of stuff. Um, but it helps me at least know that there are people who, I mean, especially right now in this crisis, this pandemic that we're in, the coverage is, it wildly varies. And then finally, just fighting for transparency in general. Um, so. Trusting an algorithm is different from knowing the source code. Kathy O'Neill, again, the author of Weapons of Math Destruction says, um, we're not asking, when we fight for transparency, a lot of companies will say, oh, we can't tell you it's our proprietary algorithm. But we're not really asking them to like expose the raw algorithm to us. We're asking them what things are taken into account so that we can understand um, how the inputs become the outputs, but not down to the code level. Okay, so that's been a ton of content. It's almost two, so I know some people might need to head out, but um, I am here, so if people have questions or if people have asked questions in the chat, um, I would love to talk about those. Oh yeah, there's an assessment form. And sorry, this is Sam. Um, sorry that you can probably hear my kids in the background, but um, I dropped the assessment form in the chat um, so far, there's not questions, but if y'all want to unmute yourself, um, I can stay past two um, and uh, I could stop the recording if anyone wants that. Um, and again, put your questions in the chat. If you have to go, we understand like Jenny said, um, but please fill out this quick assessment. I'll drop it one more time and then um, uh, to let us know how you thought this went. Uh, and as Jen, I'm going to put Jenny's link to the slides and uh, sorry, I'm laughing at my daughter in the background. Um, and I thought you put your kids away. I tried. <laughs> they, <laughs> they can only be contained so long. Uh, um, Susan asked a question about yeah. algorithms. Okay. Um, so yes, Susan, I have I have definitely seen information about this, um, particularly as it um, as it pertains to gender. So I was uh, planning to teach a women's gender and sexuality studies course on this topic, um, which is why I have so much information that I just crammed into this hour. Um, and that was a big thing I wanted to talk about is the way facial recognition um, is being used, especially for things like job interviews um, and uh, like CCTV uh, surveillance, that kind of stuff. Um, so there is a lot out there about that that I've seen like news wise people talking about it people sharing concerns. Um, but uh, yeah, so that's uh, so there's stuff out there and I can also send you um, some links. Yes. Uh, racial bias for sure. There was a big issue with Google images um, and with Google photos where it was identifying um, Black people as like 
gorillas are apes, uh, which obviously we know is terrible in every possible way. Um, so there, there's definitely, I've looked at it a lot in terms of that um, gender conversation, particularly as it relates to gender identity and trans and non-binary people. Um, but yeah, there's a, a huge amount of racial bias um, in the sort of facial recognition algorithms as well. Mm, yeah. I, Susan, I think I have a couple of articles about that and I will look through um, my Zotero, my packed Zotero folder and send some to you if I see them. Well, thank you all so much. Um, yeah, I know that was a ton of information. It was actually longer when I did it with the class because I had 75 minutes with them. So I do feel like I just like went running, even though I have not gotten up for hours. Um, so thank you all so much. Please feel free to contact me if you have questions about this. Um, you know, none of this is my personal research, but it's something that I care a lot about and I think a lot about. Um, and tried to put together in a way that hopefully made some sense. Thank you all, you're all so wonderful. Thank you all for being part of this virtual learning community. Um, I am really excited about it and how it's going. Um, and I hope many of you are interested in the Know Your Libraries trivia tomorrow. Leanne and I kind of tested out the system yesterday. It worked pretty well. Um, and you'll, you might be interested to know what you do and don't know about the UNCG University Libraries. So thank you all very much. Um, Sam, I think we can stop the recording. I don't think I have that option. Yeah, and there's always the VLC sign up if you want to sign up for a session. Um, I would encourage people to go, uh, if you're interested in talking about gaming and gamers in the library, uh, you can self sign up for our Canvas course for this, uh, for the VLC, or I can invite you, or Sam can invite you. Um, Amanda and Juanita have an ongoing conversation in Canvas about gamers and gaming in the library based on some really interesting research that they've done um, and a great poster that they did. Um, so if you want to get in on that conversation and you're not already, please let us know. We can get you there. Thank you all very much.